part of the definition of right concentration is that you seclude your mind from sensual thoughts, sensual obsessions. And it's not easy. The mind likes to spend a lot of time planning sensual pleasures. There was once a man who came to see Ananda. He said, I hear the monks, even the young monks, train their minds to put aside sensual passions, sensual thoughts, sensual plans. I don't believe that. How can that be? And so Ananda takes him to see the Buddha. And the Buddha says, well, even when I was a young monk, it wasn't easy. My mind didn't leap at the idea of giving up sensual pleasures. But I realized that for the mind to gain stillness, to gain a sense of solidity, it was going to have to put sensual passion, sensual ideas aside, at least for the time being. And so the way he did it was twofold. One was to think of the drawbacks of sensuality, and the other was to think of the rewards of renunciation. If we compare this to the factors of the path, it falls under right effort. As we chanted just now, chandang janeti, generating desire. Desire does have a role in the path, the desire to abandon any unskillful thoughts that have arisen and to prevent unskillful thoughts from arising again, to give rise to any skillful thoughts or mental qualities that haven't arisen yet, and to maintain and develop those that have. In each case, you have to generate the desire to do this. Try to get your mind on the idea that, get it on the side of the idea that this is what you want to do. That involves psyching yourself out, giving yourself reasons that actually motivate you to put aside your usual pleasures, to look for something better. And the texts recommend a lot of different ways of doing this. Part of it is just that, that learning to see the drawbacks of sensuality. The Buddha has lots and lots of passages. Remember that time I was in Laguna and someone complained, why is there so much on the drawbacks of sensuality? And of course, it's because we're so attached to sensuality. We have to keep hammering the point home. All the trouble that we go through in work, the lay people work and work and work and get paid, and then there's a fear that maybe they not, may not get paid, or even if they do get paid, it's not going to be enough, or it's going to get stolen, or as I say, kings or thieves will make off with it, hateful heirs will make off with it. It's because of our sensual desire that we get into wars and battles, even battles at home. There are a lot of drawbacks to sensuality. And it's good to think about them. It helps incline the mind to the idea that maybe it would be good just to put those thoughts aside and see if you can develop a sense of ease, a sense of well-being that doesn't have to depend on them. It's not like the Buddha is going to starve you. He gives you an alternative pleasure. In the beginning it's hard because the mind doesn't seem to want to settle down and work toward it. So in the beginning you're going on faith, you're going on conviction that this is something you really should want. And that right there seems to be a contradiction in terms should and want. We think of wanting as something that happens naturally. But you can induce a desire. That's what you try to do. Seeing renunciation as rest is another one. There's that famous passage of the former king who had become a monk. And he goes and he sits under a tree and says, what bliss, what bliss. And the monks are afraid that he's thinking about his past pleasures as king. So they go tell the Buddha. The Buddha calls him into his presence. He says, I hear you've been sitting under a tree, saying, what bliss, what bliss, what do you have in mind? 
as you say this. And the monk says, well, back when I was a king, I couldn't sleep at night, even though I had guards inside the palace, outside the palace, inside the capital city, outside the capital city, inside the countryside, on outside the borders of the countryside. I still couldn't sleep at night for fear that I would be attacked, killed. But now I sit under a tree this is my, with my mind like a wild deer, feeling no fear from any direction. That's the bliss I think about. That's the bliss of renunciation. Because we see this so many times. People who have amassed wealth, amassed power, realize that they're in danger because of their wealth and their power. That's very few of them who, like that king, would realize, okay, you'd be a lot better off just sitting under a tree with a mind like a wild deer. So th those are two ways of inducing the desire to let go of unskillful states and develop skillful ones. There are other ways of doing it as well. One is humor. The Buddha has a sutta where he talks about the reasons why people are lazy and the reasons why they're diligent. For the lazy people, it's it says you haven't had enough to eat. You say, oh, I've got to rest. Or if you've been sick, you say, well, I've been sick, I've got to rest. And it goes on, everything, everything, I've got to rest. And that's for the reasons for being diligent. They're the same reasons. You've been sick. Now you've recovered a little bit. You don't know. Maybe the illness could get worse. So you try to practice. You haven't had much to eat. Well, you realize, if I haven't had much to eat, my mind is light, my body is light, it's great for practicing, and so on down the line. In other words, the externals are the same in each case. It's simply the attitude you had toward it and the way you phrase it. It is humorous. The reasons that some people see as obstacles to their practice, other people see as opportunities. And the Buddha also uses the, a sense of pride and honor as a reason for why you should practice. For the monks, this means living up to the fact that you are a monk. When you say you're contemplative, are you really a contemplative? Or are you just here as a tourist, checking it out, seeing what it's like, wearing robes, playing the role of a monk? If you have any sense of honor, you'd want to Make your mind the mind of a monk, the mind of a contemplative. Another motivation there is that you're here receiving alms from people, all these requisites, as an act of kindness to them. You want to keep practicing, partly to pay back the debt and partly so that their gifts to you will bear great fruit for them. That's part of the way karma works. But the Buddha also talks in terms of looking at the practice with a sense of pride and honor in your ability to do it. There's one sutta where he talks about five different kinds of warriors. There's a warrior who sees the dust of the approaching army, and he grows faint, runs away. There's the warrior who sees the top of the banner of the approaching army, feels faint, runs away. There's the soldier who actually has the army running at him. Here, here's the tumult, here's the noise of the army, gets faint, runs away. There's this soldier who gets engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat, gives up, loses. And then there's a soldier who comes out winning, doesn't get faint when he sees the dust of the approaching army, doesn't get faint when he sees the banner, 
hears a tumult or actually gains, engages in hand to hand combat, he comes out victorious. Then the Buddha compares this to five different kinds of monks. There's the monk who hears us, a beautiful woman over in that village. Just the thought that there are beautiful women out there, that's enough to make him give up. That's the one who sees the dust of the approaching army. Then there's one who actually sees a beautiful woman. He's the one who sees the top of the banner of the army and gets faint, gives up. There's the one who hears the tumult of the approaching army. He's sitting out meditating under a tree, and a woman comes up and she makes fun of him. He gives up. There's the one who engages in hand-to-hand -hand combat, and the woman actually comes up she throws herself all over him. He gives up the training. The one who comes out victorious is, doesn't grow faint with any of these things, stays with his resolve that he's going to try to overcome his sensual passion. Okay, the Buddha teaches in this way to, to instill a sense of honor, a sense of pride, that this is an accomplishment. Some people look down on monks say that there's one Dharma teacher I know who his highest praise for me is he says, I would have made a good layperson. For him, most monks are losers. We don't look at it that way. We see that our ability to overcome sensuality is not a weakness, it's a strength. And it requires a sense of honor to do this, a sense of pride. And of course, the problem with pride is that you tend to compare yourself with other people. And the, but the Buddha put, tries to put a check on that, reminding us that we're not here to compete with other people. We're here going to compete with ourselves. When he talks about the traditions of the Noble Ones, your ability to be content with whatever you get in terms of food, clothing, and shelter. He says you're also careful not to compare yourself with other people who are not so content. You don't try to exalt yourself or disparage others around this. You realize that you're here to overcome your own weakness. As he says, when you are able to overcome your weakness in this way, your heedlessness in this way. It's like the moon released from the cloud and illumines the world. When someone just does that, it makes the world a brighter place. The Buddha also gives comparisons with skills. One time Ananda was watching some youths in the city of Waisale practicing their archery skills. They were able to shoot arrows through keyholes from a great distance. He goes back and reports this to the Buddha. So that's quite an accomplishment. And the Buddha says, well, which is more difficult, to pierce a key keyhole with an arrow or to take a very fine hair and use it to pierce the tip of another very fine hair? And then says, oh, even the second one is even more amazing skill. And the Buddha says, well, even more amazing than that skill is the skill of being able to pierce the truths of suffering, its cause, its cessation, and the path to its sensation. In other words, reminding Ananda that this path it requires a lot of skill. And when you can accomplish it, you've accomplished a great skill, the pride in your craftsmanship. So the Buddha uses a sense of honor and pride as a way of generating desire to develop skillful qualities in the mind and abandon unskillful ones. It's a shame that in modern society the sense of honor seems to have deteriorated as we become a consuming society. There's not much honor in consuming. We take pride in amassing things, but the pride that comes with a skill that seems to be disappearing from our society, and that's a real shame. Because the state of mind that's required to develop a skill makes better people out of us. So if you can think of some skill that you've mastered. And the sense of pride and accomplishment that comes from having overcome whatever problems, whatever difficulties lay in your way. I'm going to take that same sense of accomplishment and apply it to the practice, that this is a much 
more rewarding skill, a much more useful skill, even though it's a much more difficult skill. That should simply spark you to even greater efforts. So you can generate that desire. That's such an essential part of right effort. So instead of bemoaning that you have to give this up or give that up, think of the good things that come in your own mind when you have the strength to give things up. Because after all, renunciation is not only a skill, but also it's a trade. You're, you're trading in something of little value for something of a much greater value. You're trading candy for gold. And you're doing something that's very difficult. So instead of getting, feeling faint at the difficulty, you should stir yourself up to say, yes, I can do this. As Ananda says, this is the proper use of conceit and pride in the path. Other people can do this, why can't I? That's the way in which desire and conceit are actually part of the path. We think of them usually as things that have to be overcome and abandoned, but if they're properly used, they do have their role. So learn to make use of them whenever it's appropriate.